public school has taken on a sacral character. And thus the defense of public education became an exercise in political ecclesiology. This interpretation helps to explain the devout tone so evident in their protective praising of the public school and the absoluteness with which they rejected any hint of state grants for parochial schools. By its very nature as a, quote, sectarian institution, the Catholic school was ill-equipped to pass on the public faith fully and freely expressed to the coming generation. I'm going to call your attention to an expression I believe peculiar to the United States. Public schools meant to describe what other countries more accurately classify as state or government schools. Furthermore, let me underscore the purpose of American public schools. The production of a generation thinking in accord with national goals and values. And the same can be asserted, I believe, for all state-sponsored educational institutions throughout the world. Now, this is not necessarily a bad purpose, but one which should give freedom-loving people at least some pause. Very simply put, it is as dangerous for governments to run schools as it is for them to run churches, since both necessarily involve the forming of men's minds and hearts. And so Samuel Blumenfeld comments, the Catholics were aware enough to see what it would all lead to and bolted the public school rather than accept the destruction of their faith. Earlier I used the word countercultural and want to emphasize the importance of that concept. The best example of how a countercultural education in Catholic schools has affected the social structure of America is clearly seen in the strength and youthfulness of the pro-life movement. A few days after the 2010 March for Life in Washington, a journalist in favor of, quote, abortion rights, wrote an article in the Washington Post, surprise, surprise, <laughs> noting that he was, quote, expecting to write about the March's irrelevance. However, he indicated, I was especially struck by the large number of young people among the tens of thousands at the march. He highlighted the fact that the vast majority of those young people came from Catholic schools who, in his words, were taught from an early age to oppose abortion. The piece remarkably ended up very fair and even positive. I maintain, without fear of contradiction, that without the Catholic schools, there would have been no serious pro-life movement in the United States. Why? Because the government schools begin their indoctrination programs in the earliest years of elementary school and thus create a cadre of youth in their own image and likeness. The Catholic schools also pass on a value system from the earliest years, but from a gospel perspective. Anecdotally, I should observe that in my many years of teaching theology at the university level, I have never encountered a female graduate of a Catholic secondary school who publicly, at least, advance the abortion agenda. And conversely, never encountered a female graduate of the state secondary school who was anything but virulently and vocally pro-abortion. A major and persistent objection to religiously oriented schools is the charge of fostering sectarianism. Objective research, however, disproves that allegation. There is no evidence of Catholic schools being divisive. On the contrary, those who attend them seem to be more supportive, for example, of racial integration, and have a higher level of social consciousness than those who do not attend Catholic schools. Pope Benedict XVI responded to this accusation and turned it around in his address to the bishops of Scotland during their upcoming visit two years ago. He said, you can be proud of the contribution made by Scotland's Catholic schools in overcoming sectarianism and building good relations between communities. He goes on, faith schools are a powerful force for social cohesion, and when the occasion arises, you do well to underline this point. Catholic schools, he said, produce articulate and well-informed followers capable of taking part in the highest levels of pu Scottish public life. He goes on, a strong Catholic presence in the media local and national politics, the judiciary, the professions, and the universities can only serve to enrich Scotland's national life. As people of faith bear witness to the truth, especially when that truth is called into question. 
He also connected Catholic schools with the much needed effort of the bishops to combat what he called the increasing tide of secularism in Scotland. In the past year, as the bishops of the United States have made their unlimited visits, the Pope underscored the critical importance of Catholic schools on several occasions. The value of a total education in a religious ambiance has become increasingly appreciated in American society. Whereas such a conviction was almost uniquely Catholic 50 years ago, now it's not uncommon to hear strong support for this position coming from evangelicals and even reform, that is, liberal Jews. Rabbi Jacob Neusner asked, without institutions and organizations to give direction and substance to the life of such groups, what is left but inchoate sentiment? Surely that's what was meant by the assertion that Hebrew day schools are necessary for, quote, a truly meaningful Jewish community in America. We Catholics would do well to heed that advice. I hope I've shown how the church in the United States responded to an anti-Catholic threat by fashioning her own school system, and how that school system has served both the church and the broader society very well. The secularization now taking Europe by storm and now menacing the United States can only be held off and even reversed if the church is able to offer her members an alternative vision of life, what sociologists call a viable subculture. In essence, that's what St. Benedict did as the decadent Roman culture was breathing its last. And that alternate vision saved not only the church, but all of Western culture. The principal agent of that renewal was a monasticism which founded schools everywhere. And what emerged in relatively short order was the glorious Middle Ages, the age of faith, with the good, the true, and the beautiful producing a superabundance of magnificent works of literature, art, music, and architecture. An education devoid of God, my friends, is an anti-education the fruits of which we are witnessing in spades in this country for at least two generations now. Thomas Merton, <clears throat> reflecting on some years of his boyhood spent in France between the two world wars, contrasted a government school in his village with a Catholic one. And he ended by noting it this way. Catholics, Catholics of thousands of Catholics everywhere have the consummate audacity to weep and complain because God does not hear their prayers for peace when they've neglected not only his will, but the ordinary dictates of natural reason and prudence, and have let their children grow up in institutions according to the standards of a civilization of hyenas. I want to encourage you, beg you, not to allow another generation to grow up according to the standards of a civilization of hyenas. We shall have to train a new generation of Catholics to part company with many of their parents and grandparents in exercising their voting franchise, not according to party loyalty, but according to the mind of Christ. And we've all heard the mantra, you can't be a single issue voter. True enough. However, there is such a thing as having a candidate whose positions are what we may call disqualifying positions. Anyone who promotes an agenda which is inherently evil disqualifies himself as a candidate worthy of consideration in a civilized culture. What are some issues that render a candidate disqualified? Anyone who would seek to challenge the right to religious liberty? Anyone who would endeavor to silence the voice of conscience? Anyone who would advance programs that call into question the sacredness of human life? from conception to natural death. Anyone who would entertain redefining the natural and divinely revealed nature of marriage. Invariably, we hear a response to concerns like this. But can Big Joe has so many other wonderful positions on behalf of the poor and the marginalized? Well, let's consider two possible alternative scenarios. A candidate who represents a program of societal improvement which advances the health and well-being of the poor, but happens to believe that Hitler was really right in his hatred of Jews, and that restoring such a vision would be a valuable contribution to our national life. 
for the same candidate, whose commitment to eradicating poverty was colored over by the idiosyncratic view that President Lincoln never should have signed the Emancipation Proclamation and that blacks really ought to be back in shackles again. Would any right-thinking, fair-minded person give such a candidate a second thought, no matter how meritorious the rest of his platform might be? Similarly, we are not unreasonable to maintain that one who thinks it's civilized to kill innocent babies in their mother's wombs is not worthy of a vote in a civilized nation.